You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 11. In this episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, we're going to be joined by Larry Lutnegger, CEO of Pattern Master and Choke Tubes, and we're also going to introduce you to a new segment of the show where we profile a new duck every week. All right, we would like to welcome you to this, the 11th episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We've got a great show lined up for you this week. We're going to be joined by Larry Lutnegger, who is the uh, CEO of Pattern Master Choke Tubes, and uh, he's going to come on the show and discuss with us, uh, you know, a lot of questions that, that you know folks have about choke tubes and some misconceptions, and kind of give us some guidance on you know things that we should consider when selecting choke tubes for our appropriate setups and all that kind of stuff. So, got a good conversation coming up with Larry. And then, um, you know, we're going to introduce a new segment to the show, and we're going to profile a duck, uh, a different duck every every episode for a while. And um, you know, this week we're going to start off with the uh, the most common of all ducks in the U.S. here, the mallard. So, should be a good uh, you know little tidbit about about one of the most popular ducks to hunt here uh, in the states. Joining me for all of this conversation, as always, is my co-host, uh, Dan Harushka. Dan, how are you today, sir? I'm doing pretty well. I've been checking out my 10-day forecast and uh, the end of next week, which happens to be the end of archery season. We're getting a little bit of an Arctic blast coming down, so um, it's going to be, one, good for archery hunting, and two, it's going to be pushing some birds down, so it doesn't get any better than this time of year right now. Yep, it's going to time up perfectly here for the season in Virginia. Comes back in on uh, 15 November, so uh, you know, right in the couple of days, you know, before our season starts, that front's going to be coming through. So hopefully, we'll get some new new birds in the area. But you mentioned archery hunting, and I took my bow out for the first time this week. Um, for the first time this season, didn't didn't do any good. Had a couple does around me, but um, it felt good to get back out in the deer woods. It had been a while. But, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the time that I'm, I'm in the deer woods hunting, um, I'm just thinking about, you know, duck and geese hunting and, and waiting for that season to come back. So it's a far cry from what I used to be. I used to be a diehard archery hunter and now, um, I've definitely changed over a little bit, but, um, I know you've been spending some time in the blind, uh, deer woods as well. Yeah. Uh, now that the time changed, I, I can make it out in the mornings and, um, this morning I passed up two two eight points they're about two and a half year old and just looking to go with the more mature deer in the coming years so uh, there's a couple around that I wouldn't mind getting a shot at so I'm kind of holding out but uh yeah nothing nothing yet but uh the other day I was talking to you and I said man I wish I was you know hunting some honkers right now because it was windy and just a perfect day for for bird hunting but um I chose the wrong way to go so so be it but I'll I'll get back after the birds here pretty shortly. Yeah, I, I can't wait. I'm I'm super excited. It feels, you know, we had the four day season here in Virginia in um early October and I just feel like it's been so long since I've, you know, had the chance to get back out there. But um, you know, had some decoys come in and did some rigging there with those and all that kind of stuff. So I'm definitely uh, chomping at the bit to get back and I'm excited so you know, and 15 November can't come any sooner. So, uh, but today's show, um, is a good one because we've got something new that we're going to introduce to the show. Uh, we're going to introduce our, our mallard duck, uh, profile for this week. And, um, we're going to basically just profile a different duck or goose every week for a while. And, uh, just sort of bring you some information about some ducks that you might know pretty commonly and you know some ones that you may not know as much about so a little bit of a learning opportunity if you've won if you you know have a particular duck or goose that you'd like to hear us profile um give us a call 724-609-FOWL 724-609-3695 you can leave us a message on there and um you know we will you know try to try to you know review the birds that you guys want to hear about you can also reach us at info at hpoutdoors.com on our website uh, Facebook, Twitter, all of that good stuff. Um, you know, reach us, reach out to us there, and we'll 
we'll go in the directions that you guys want to. But we figured that this week would be um, appropriate to start off with the mallard because it's you know the most one of the most popular ducks to hunt in this in the U.S. It's the most populated duck, and um, you know it's something that I think everybody can relate to a little bit, Dan, when it comes to uh, you know seeing the green you know green heads coming in is just um it's something special that most waterfowlers hold, you know hold pretty dear yeah and i just want to start out by saying i'm i'm excited about this segment just because you know a lot of the diver ducks i've never really hunted or you know had a chance to hunt so you know learning a little more about them i'm i'm excited about that but being that this is new i am going to pop a question on you right now and since we're Uh-oh. we're 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 starting with the mallard so Answer me this. What is the oldest mallard that has been reported via band information? The longest living mallard. Mm. You know, I've I've seen I've seen this somewhere. Um boy. I can't remember. I might be getting this mixed up with the Canada goose, but I want to say it's in the neighborhood of like 30 years old or something crazy like that. And you're not too far off. It's actually 26 years and four months old, which is 26 years. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that tells you a little bit, you know, as to why it's the most populated duck, you know, in the U.S. I mean, 26 years. Good grief. You know, there's a lot of a lot of miles on those wings and you know, a lot of breeding cycles and that kind of stuff with that that duck. So um, it's awesome that, you know that there's opportunities for, for ducks to live that long. And it's amazing that that bird can make it up and down the flyway year after year and evade all the hunters out there and stuff like that. So, um, awesome information. But since you seem to be our, our mallard expert here and have all the, all the information, why don't you go ahead and uh, get us started here with our, with our mallard duck profile? I would say I'm not an expert, but I will, uh, talk a little bit about the almighty green head here. All right, let's let's start with a male. A male, you're coming in at about 24 and a half inches and weighing 2.7 pounds. Uh, the female's not too far behind it. You're talking 23 inches, about an inch and a half shorter than the male, uh, 2.4 pounds. The, t- the description of the the male, obviously, it is very recognizable. You have the green head that, you know, if you're on Facebook, you just see, you know, it's time for green. I'm seeing green. It's you know just the the almighty duck, but um, as green head, it has a, a white ring around the neck. It kind of sep- separates the green head and uh, kind of a chestnut brown chest. Um, you have some gray sides, a brownish back, and uh, the speculum, which is always beautiful. It's a violet blue. It's bordered by black and white, and uh, the outer tail feathers are white has a yellow to a yellowish green bill and the legs you know you always see pictures of the feet down mallards landing you know you're coming in those those have a coral red look to them um the male makes a creep sound and if you ever watch duck dynasty you know there's a lot of duck dynasty haters but you see phil calling on youtube videos and it's it's not real high like a tree frog but it's a lower creep sound um, going on to the, the female, you know, they make the, the sounds of the series of quacks and that's what everyone, when they pick up a, a duck call, that's what they make. Quack, 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 quack. Um, you're looking, they have a, a mottled brownish color of violet speculum bordered by black and white. Um, the head is a dark brown, has a dark brown stripe running through the eye and the remainder of the head, I mean, it's pretty much all brown. It's a lighter brown. A little more light than the upper body. And then the bill on a female is the orange splotched with a little bit of brown. And the legs and feet of the female are a nice bright orange. And that's a little little description of the the mallard duck there. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't realize that the the male drake mallard makes the creep noise. And the the female is the one that makes all the quacks. I I don't think that, you know, everybody realizes that not both you know, the female and the male make those quacks that you're imitating on a, on a duck call. So, um, that may be a little bit of a surprise to, to some folks out there. But yeah. One thing, yeah, as I'd mentioned, I was going to say one thing that I, I do enjoy doing when I'm out in a duck blind is making that creep sound. And it's almost, I don't know if I want to say it's a comfort sound, but you know, knowing it's not the loud blasting 
quack 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 all the time but just more of a you know a battleship just floating around down there making that sound so i i enjoy that and, well, it's, it's, and it always uh, <laughs> it seems to work quite often so i i do like the, using that call well it's an effective call because you know the duck does make that noise in the natural uh environment and it's not a call that a lot of guys in the field use you know they're mostly just laying on the the hen call you know so using that mallard creep noise is a you know an effective way to be a little bit different than what they're hearing at every blind they fly by as they go down the river um as i had mentioned the mallard duck is the absolute most common duck in the united states 2014 survey totals have uh the mallard at 10.9 million birds man that, that's five percent higher than it was in, tw- in 2013 and 42 percent above the long-term average for mallard so the mallard population is absolutely just thriving right now one of the reasons for that is because they've got the most extensive breeding range you know of any duck in north america um you know primarily in the u.s it's the northern third of the u.s but um they also go all the way up to the bering sea and you know a female is going to lay an average of nine eggs so there's just a lot of opportunity for you know great hatch and, and great success uh breeding there you know highest population densities for the mallard are going to be in the you know the prairie pothole regions saskatchewan Alberta, Manitoba, you know, northern uh, North Dakota, those areas of the U.S. Conversely, the the same thing there with the height of the migration is going to take place for mallards in the Mississippi and the central flyways. Um, but they are one of the latest uh, fall migrants among all the dabbling ducks. You know, you obviously are going to get your, your teal and ducks like that that are going to move out ahead of the mallards. Um, but they do have one of the longest, most extended migration. You know, some will start, you know, as early as the late summer. And then they'll continue all the way into into the masses into the early winter. So um, a nice long flight uh, for you know for the mallards, and they typically feed on you know seeds and rootlets and you know various aquatic plants and things that they can find on the bottom of swamps and rivers and stuff like that. So um, you know in general here, just you know the mallard is one of those majestic ducks that all waterfowlers can quickly identify, uh, quickly reference. One of the best table fare that you'll find out there. And uh, one of the fe- you know funnest ducks to hunt in general. So, uh, you know, there's lots of information out there about mallards, but this is just sort of a quick little rundown of, uh, you know, what the mallard duck is. All right, Dan. So we're going to be joined um, momentarily here on the show by Larry Lutenager, who is the CEO of Pattern Master and Choke Tubes. And we wanted to have uh, Larry on the show because um, Pattern Master choke tubes are made in Pennsylvania. That's a home state for both of us where we grew up, raised, used to live there. I get back as much as I can. But, you know, we wanted to um, talk to a local guy, you know, then support, you know, the companies doing business in the the Commonwealth of uh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, Larry has a lot of information and he's a very knowledgeable guy when it comes to choke tubes and, and gunsmithing and things of that nature. Um, so to have him on the show is, is really an honor and, and a, a privilege to, to have somebody of his, of his caliber and his quality of knowledge on the show. But, you know, we get a lot of questions about choke tubes and what should we be looking for and, you know, what do you guys use and, you know, all of these kind of things. So that's a lot, some of the stuff that we hope to be able to tackle when we get Larry on the, on the line here. Yeah. And I think, I think choke tubes are very, um, underrated and, you know, guys getting into it, just, they don't know what to use or they don't think about what to use and kind of, you know, this has been working for me or I'll go out and try it. But, um, the more that I look into his site and what pattern master has going over there, there is a science behind it. And I'm excited to talk to him because it just seems like they're ahead of the game. And, uh, you know, some of the things that you see on our website and Facebook page, like, it's pretty impressive, and I I think that um, if you haven't checked them out, you definitely should. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where you can you can search different forums, and everybody's got their company that they support and they think is better, and all that kind of stuff. But um, you know, Pattern Master does uh, some unique things with their choke tube, so it's definitely an interesting concept that they have. And um, you know, he definitely opened my eyes to some things. Uh, you know, that I didn't realize and I hadn't really considered when talking about choke tubes. So um, why don't we go ahead and get into that? And uh, we're going to we're going to have a chat with the CEO of Pattern Master Chokes, 
Larry Lutnager. All right, we are excited to welcome Larry Lutnager to the show. Larry is the CEO of Pattern Master Chokes. Uh, Larry, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you for asking. All right. Well, we're glad to have you on the show. Um, you're going to be able to answer a lot of questions for us that we get, uh, you know, onto the show here from our listeners about choke tubes and, you know, making the right selections and, you know, what all goes into the process of uh, deciding which one's going to be best for it, you know, the each person's situation and all of that good stuff. So we're really glad you're here. And, um, you know, kind of generally to get started with the conversation here. I'd like you to talk to us a little bit about, you know, some of the factors that waterfowl hunters should consider when they're picking a choke tube. I mean, I think a lot of guys, you know, they might get a, a gun handed down to them from their dad, or they may buy one used that's got a choke already in it, and maybe they just go with it because that's what's already there, and they may not know exactly why they're, you know, which ones they should be choosing. So, talk to us a little bit about some of the factors that a guy should consider when he's, you know, picking out a choke tube. Well, when when uh when they first started, uh, you know, they passed the law about having to use a steel shot. It kind of changed the game somewhat uh, because the steel, you know, it doesn't uh, it doesn't carry like lead does because it's not as heavy. But uh, there are there are choke tubes out there that will shoot the steel every bit as good of it as, as good as uh, you know the lead. Um, I've talked to a lot of people when I go to shows and stuff and they, they say, well, you know, that lead just doesn't, or the steel just doesn't, uh, doesn't bring them down. You know, so many of them get away. Well, mostly because of the choke tube. It's just not holding things together and hitting them like, you know, to bring them down. This is a, uh, the waterfowl is a very, very hard thing to, uh, to bring down. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, uh, using steel in itself has its challenges. And, um, you know, I think that's why, uh, you know, the choke is so vitally important for the waterfowler specifically, you know, who doesn't have the benefit of using lead. Uh, so take us through some of the things, um, that make the decision so important, you know, um, obviously with a company like yours, you guys have a ton of, uh, time and research put into, you know, different, uh, prototypes and things to find out what works the best, what doesn't all of that sort of stuff. So talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, the selection process of the, pro of the choke tube and, and just why that is so important for a hunter. Well, the, the, the big, big thing about our product or most most all of our products is we we totally look at um, constricting shot differently than than they've ever done before because you know everybody has always used constriction to try to tighten patterns well that's good but it's like uh, pouring sand in a funnel you know everything can't pass through at the same time so in in your shotgun what happens is your shot string can get strung out over 20 feet. Well, if you're shooting at something stationary, that's not really it's not really a big deal. But when you're shooting something that's flying or moving and you have 20 feet of shot string, you know, even if you hit it, you wasted so much more of your pattern than what you used. So you end up with a lot of cripples flying away and and uh things like that. Um Now, the, the way that the way that uh we control it we don't use constriction to control the pattern. Inside of our pattern masters, we have a series of five little blocks or studs is what we call them. And uh, as the wad comes through carrying the shot, and the base of the wad will catch for a fraction of a second on the base of the wad, allowing all that shot to go out at the same time. So we're able to take 20 feet of shot string, and we're able to condense it down to about three to three and a half feet. So now, when you have something flying and moving like that, you hit, but you hit with almost all of your pattern. Now, if you're, you know, if you're not a real good shot, or, or uh, you either hit it or you miss it. You know what I mean? But you don't get the cripples. Now, most people, when they buy a choke tube, first thing you want to go out is shoot it on some paper and see how it does. Well, that's fine if you're, you know, like turkey hunters or things like that. But that's that that can show you uh, the tightness or the density of your of your pattern, but if it's stretched out over twenty feet, 
uh, you're still not using all that pattern, even though it shows you that on paper. Now, the way that we we found that we could test ours to prove that it's actually doing what we say it does is we shoot it over water. And I, I know all of those waterfowlers out there have shot a duck or a goose and it and brought it down and it swims around in the water and you, you shoot at it out there and it keeps swimming and you shoot at it and you shoot at it and you know if you're shooting some of that ammunition you know that's three four dollars a shot so it gets very costly to try to chase that duck around but uh, we have something on our website showing a, a regular constriction type show shot across water and then one of our pattern masters shot across the water, and it's it's like night and day. When you shoot it with a pattern master, it just goes whoomp all at one time, right there where the duck is, and he don't swim away anymore. I think everybody, yeah. I think everybody would like uh, you know a few less cripples to chase around, especially uh, you know when you got birds trying to work your your spread and stuff. So um, I never really thought about it like you just described it, though, and it's a really interesting point because. It makes a lot of sense to me when you're patterning a shotgun for a turkey, um, you know, being standing there in, in, in one spot where, uh, you know, when you've got a, a duck or a goose flying, um, you know, side to side or parallel to you, um, you know, you don't necessarily get to use all of that shot. So that's a that's a really interesting uh, point and nothing, you know, something that I've never really considered. So, um, you know, that's a that's definitely an, a, a different way of thinking, which kind of, you know, obviously lends itself to the, you know, your style of product that you guys offer. So um, really great point with that. Yeah. So Larry, let me ask you when, when guys are going out to select a choke, what are some of the, you know, just common mistakes that people are making? I know, you know, there's a ton of misinformation out there on the internet, you know, or you might just be, you know, talking to a friend that has a certain choke that he might like. So you go with him, but what are some mistakes that people make or what's a good way about, you know, going and picking out the correct choke? Well, if you, if you're, uh, the, the way that we categorize our, our pattern masters and our code blacks are, um, our extended range is normally for distances, 70 yards, 80 yards, you know, way out there. So if you're shooting at them way up there, you're sky busting them, you know, something like that would be, would, would be what you'd want. Now, if you're coming in a little bit closer, you know, 60 yards, 50 yards, uh, we make a long range. And our, actually the long range is, is, uh, probably our most versatile. And that's because if you, our stud system is placed inside that choke in, in such a way. So when the base of that hits, the front of the wad is flush with the front of the tube. If you're shooting two and three quarter or three inch shells. So it keeps it together and gives you a fold, an extra full pattern. Now, if you shoot a three and a half inch shell in there, you have a wad that's going to stick out about a half inch out the end of the, the, the tube. Uh, when, when the base of the wad hits the studs. So that turns that more into like a modified because it allows that half inch of shot to open up in a bigger, in a bigger area as it exits, but still it takes the wad away and keeps your shot string very short. And uh, the next one we have is our, our mid range, which mid range is going to take you in between or in between where the long range and the short range takes you. And that will be uh, probably 50, 40 yards. And then we have our, our short range and we also have, it's also called over decoy, which some of the hunters have named it that. Uh, it's also called pigeon and uh, timber, but it's it's the same tube. It's just depending on where where we're selling it and uh, what the uh, hunters would relate it to in that area. But uh, the way that it works, we don't change the inside of our tubes to. Uh, change the size of the pattern like like a regular constriction tube would the way that we do it is we cut the front of the tube back toward that stud ring our extended tube is is real long that sticks out the front of your your barrel as we cut it back the long range then it it makes it uh full to an extra full with a two and three quarter inch and like i just described with the three and a half that would turn it into a modified. Now to bring it back 
we bring it back a little step farther, and that allows more wad to stick out the front, allowing it to go in a bigger circle, but still keeping that shot string very short and dense. So it just like it, it keeps building a wall bigger that hits it all at once. And then when you get to the short range, which we have a lot of hunters that that's all they use is just the short range because it carries so far that, uh, and hits them so hard and it, it allows you a bigger area. You know, you have a, a more of a fudge factor with it. Right. So that's, and, and for our listeners out there, Pattern Master has, you know, they named their own. An improved cylinder would be, like a, a their short range and their modified is their mid range. So, Larry, let's talk about how much of a difference is there between, say, your short range and mid range, and mid and long, and the pattern density that um, that hunters should expect at at common yardages. And I mean, it's just listening to you. I know that you have just a ton of science behind everything, and it's it's pretty nice to hear. Well. Normally, it's kind of an industry standard that they, they test at 40 yards with a 30-inch circle, and then, you know, you split up and count your BBs in there. Um, so uh, with our with our full and extended tubes, well, with our, I'll just go to the extended tube first. I mean, normally when we shoot that at 40 yards with, with the steel, now, now it, it depends on ammunition. Some ammunition shoots better than others, and and some ammunition will shoot better in this gun than it will in this gun. And, uh, you know, it's it's very uh, ammunition sensitive on a lot of guns. But uh, normally, you can expect to be probably in the 89 to 95 percent tile range with the extended. And if you're shooting two and three quarter or three inch, you're going to get that probably out of the uh, out of long range. Now, as you come back to the mid range, you're going to be down probably around. Uh, 80 percent and when you get back to the short range you're probably around between 70 and 80 so i mean that's still very very uh tight for a for a tube so you've touched on on something that i wanted to get into and and hopefully you'll be able to share a little shed a little insight on this but you mentioned how different um you know various ammo uh, brands can pattern through the same gun and that kind of thing um Obviously, that's one of the biggest reasons why people want to pattern their gun to find out which load's going to, you know, group the best with their their particular shotgun and choke setup, that kind of thing. Can you shed any light as to why that is? You know, what is it about the ammo that that they, you know, that causes it to be so erratic from brand to brand? Well, you're you're you know, when you're talking firearms, it's not a it's not an exact science. Okay, firearms are just are are funny that way. I mean, um. I've I've seen people that you know we've sold tubes to, and for instance, like a in a Remington 870, and he's getting oh, you know, eighty eighty nine percent, and and then he you give it to uh, his buddy, and he screws that same tube in his gun, and he's only getting about seventy eight percent, you know, and they're shooting the same ammo, pretty much the same gun. They're both shooting eight seventies, but just from one barrel to the next, I mean, and you know the barrels don't vary, but uh, a thousand, two thousands, from from the same brand barrel from one to the other. Now the the uh, dimensions do change as you go to different shotguns, you know, because you know where a Remington would be about seven hundred and thirty thousandths inside the barrel dimension, and a uh, Benelli might be uh, uh, seven twenty twenty eight. And, and they, uh, Browning may be, uh, 42, 742. Hmm. It varies a little bit, but they're all, they're all, uh, 12 gauge. Right. Now, if, if, for instance, if you go with the Mossberg, like the 835 Mossberg, it has a bore like a 10 gauge. Mm-hmm. It's actually a 12 gauge and, and it's, it measures out at like a seven, 790. So it's huge. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, it's, we get that question a lot and, and, you know, I've never really had a, a good answer for it. Um, and I guess it's just kind of one of those things where, you know, it's just a, you know, one of the life's mysteries that we'll never really solve for sure. Cause, uh, you know, sure would, sure would heck be a lot easier to just, you know, 
be able to go to the aisle and say, okay, I shoot this combo. You know, this is the one that patterns the best, but, um, you know, it's obviously some, uh, uh, ideal thinking there. But, um, so, so let me ask you this, Larry, <clears throat> when we're, when we're talking about choke tubes and let's just use Beretta, for example, cause that's what Dan and I shoot. So I get the three standard chokes that come with my gun, you know, a, a, a full modified and an improved cylinder. And, you know, I'm, I'm hunting with that and I'm doing well. And I, I you know, it, it's performing like I, I guess I think it should, that kind of thing. How much better in, of a performance should I expect when I purchase, you know, an upgraded or an, an aftermarket choke or a pattern mastering choke, for example. So, you know, if I hunt with, um, you know, a modified choke that came with my gun and then I bought, a you know, a mid range pattern mastered choke, how much better performance should I expect to see um, between the two? When you go out and you actually shoot something and it comes down, you will you will see with your own eyes the difference. You will see the difference. Where where you hit it with your modified to constriction choke and, and, you know, he'll flutter a little bit and come down and, and you hit him with that pattern master, I mean, it may move him through a foot. <laughs> I mean, it hits, him, it hits him so hard when they come down. So you're saying it's something that you would be able to visually tell. Um, oh, oh, yeah. And, and just by kind of getting back to what you said before, the reason for that is because, you know, the, the shot string impact is really what you're getting at, right? So, um, you know, yeah. like if I if I take my factory modified in my in my uh, pattern mastered mid-range and I put it on the range, you know, I might see similar, um, you know, pattern densities right. at, at various yardages because, you know, your tubes aren't really designed to, you know, to have an impact there, it's, it's on the other way, you know, not width, but the, the length of the shot string. So, um, I think that's important to know because I think a lot of guys would, would take that if they had not realized that's what they were getting into, they would go out to the range and, you know, shoot the chokes to compare and not see much of a difference and they might be disappointed. So I think that's a really good point to rec- you know, to make sure that people are aware that that's, well, you know, what they should expect. Well, norm- well normally, uh, normally our tubes would, they would compare right along with the, uh, like if uh, a modified tube, and, and you shot our modif- or I mean our uh, mid range, and you'd you'd see that it shoots on paper, you know, about like a modified, maybe even a little tighter, and the same with a full. You know, it would shoot on paper pretty much the same, but it's, you know, you could if you're shooting it against a constriction choke, and then this one, and they shoot the same, and you know. Uh, that one came with the gun, and this one here cost you money to buy an aftermarket. You'd say, "Well, gee, you know, they shoot the same." Well, because you're not able to see that on our on our website, we have a uh, uh, a little film clip of uh, uh, Fred Fred Zink. I don't know if you know Fred Zink. Mm-hmm. Heard of all the yeah. Zink decoys? Yeah, he's sort well, of he's sort of a you know a name I've heard once or twice. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Fred does a, a little skit on there where he explains. You know, he's been he's been shooting Pattern Master for like fifteen years, and uh, he he does a little he does a little filming out across water, and he just shows you what what's happening there and explains every step of it. Uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty interesting to to go on there to the website and just watch that. Yeah, I encourage everyone to go and check that out. Um, it's pretty impressive. So. Um, Larry, let me, let me, you, you started out by talking the difference between steel and lead and, you know, how water filers are constricted to steel shot. Now, how much, you know, if, if a guy's coming from small game hunting or, you know, upland bird hunting and getting into waterfowl and now they have to go from lead to steel, how much difference does the steel shot pattern than lead? And maybe go ahead and talk about, uh, you know, pattern master chokes and, you know, can you shoot? lead and steel through the same chokes uh yeah i really i really couldn't tell you the uh the big difference i i know they don't shoot nearly as well with the steel as they do with the but as far as percentages i really couldn't right off the top of my head tell you what the percentages would be because like i said on ammunition on guns it 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 differs but you will see a noticeable difference with the lead over the steel and it's just the just the way that it is yeah, I was just gonna add, uh, to the second part of his question there. Can you shoot uh, both lead and steel through the through the pattern master chokes? Oh, definitely, definitely. They all shoot the lead better than the steel, but 
Actually, they were designed around steel. You know, we first designed this um, back in the early 90s. You know, when, when the, you know, steel was what you had to use and it, it just came about and um, most people were very dis- discouraged with it. We just found a way that we could uh, give you a better hunt, you know. Right. You've, you've told us a lot about, <clears throat> you know, the, the types of chokes that you have and how, you know, your technology impacts the shot string and, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. And I know you guys, you know, have patented that, that kind of, uh, that technology. So, um, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here that there's, there's not really another choke tube, you know, in the game that, that can kind of, uh, you know, parallel this type of technology at all. Is that correct? Uh, not the, not the way this does. Fair enough. So how about, you know, for your best all around choke, general waterfowl use, I know you guys have several different, uh, you know, models, the original, the black, uh, uh, the anaconda, you know, the, the different chokes that you guys have, what's the best one for the general waterfowl use? Well, the best, the best with the, uh, in the pattern master line or, or the code black line, for me, would either be the short range or the long range, because I'm not I'm not one that shoots three and a half inch shells, because that hurts on both ends. <laughs> <laughs> Dan and I have talked about that a lot on this show. We're we're right there oh, with yeah. you <laughs> multiple times. Right, and and then them geese can't fly that fast anyway. So two and three quarter and three inch will still bring them down. You know, when you get the whole impact of the shot string hitting them all at once, it brings them down just like. You know, you don't need the all that extra. So I've 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 noticed on some tubes and this could be just because they're more, you know, like you talk about constriction style tubes. Um, do guys need to worry about the size of the shot or the speed of the ammo that they're using when they get into these aftermarket chokes and, you know, uh, extreme range, that kind of stuff. And I know I know your your tubes don't constrict, but being that there is something taking place inside the choke, you know, some of these ammos can be plussed up pretty good where you're getting, you know, up to 1700, you know, feet per second on the shot at the muzzle, that kind of thing. So is there something to be concerned about there for a hunter and using, you know, something too big and too fast as far as the gun's concerned? You know, for a while I I run the ballistics lab for department of Homeland security for a couple of years. And we did a lot of high speed filming of different things. and, And, uh, I've shot high speed ammo and, you know, and filmed the muzzle of the, of the barrel and, and then shot some standard velocity and filmed that. And you'll notice when you're shooting the high velocity, as it comes out, all of that gas disperses, you know, just shoots, shoots out the side all over. And when you're shooting the standard velocity, you'll see most of that gas stays right behind the wad and it just keeps pushing. So even though you're getting you're you're wasting a lot of that that gas because it, you can't keep it behind there because it's you know so much pressure. Um, we uh, at one time we were buying <clears throat> uh, uh, reduced recoil buckshot and and slugs and actually in gelatin with the uh, the reduced recoil uh, it actually penetrated farther in gelatin than the high speed stuff. So let me ask you this question. Um, we've done a segment on the show talking about the difference between three inch and three and a half inch shells. And one of the big things that, you know, Dan and I both shoot three inch and, and one of the big things that this study that we referred to was felt recoil and how much, you know, it was like a 50% gain or something like that that I'm pulling from the top of my head here. If I recall, um, a 50% harder thump on the three and a half versus the three inch, um, based on what you're just telling me, it, it sounds like, that reduced recoil that the three inch provides you would give you a slight benefit ballistically as far as, um, you know, being able to chamber all of the gas and the, you know, the explosion inside the gun, keeping your shot going in the right direction. Am I, am I reading into that too much or uh, is that accurate? I think think you're accurate. I mean, you are going to get the benefit of having more BBs, you know, with the three and a half Mm -hmm. because of the longer wad and it's more room for them. And so you're throwing more out there. But uh, it's um, it's not staying. It's not keeping that that uh, energy behind the watt and, and continuing to push because it's 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 trying to get out of the way everywhere it can. 
Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, th- I think that um, you know the choke tube, um, just the the whole concept behind all of that is a is something for an outsider that's not familiar with how all of that works. Is just it's an intimidating and sort of an unknown area because, like I said, I, I didn't even, I, you know, I, I'd been on your website and I'd seen all your stuff. I just didn't realize that, um, you know, that there wasn't any constriction there. I, I guess I just sort of thought that that <laughs> kind of had to be part of it, um, you know, well, talking about the size of, you know, the, the pattern of the gun. Now, we do we do make some uh, tubes that are anaconda line. Is a, it's a new technology we patented just a couple of years ago. And we actually do use a little bit of constriction. We use where uh, a, a regular constriction choke for a full choke would normally measure about 0. 0.690. Our full choke with the anaconda is uh, 0.705. And the reason that we, we're getting full choke patterns is because inside of the anaconda, you you notice there's a spiral that goes around in there. And what that actually is, it's a gas channel. So as the wad moves through there, it 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 does squeeze it down just a little bit, okay. Uh, and as soon as the the wad passes and exposes that spiral, it's a gas channel. That gas spins right up around that wad, and it puts like a radial brake on the wad, allowing that shot to go ahead and exit it together. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and I I had seen the uh, the anaconda line come out, and you know just the the spiral. Is a, is a unique uh, is a unique thing that you don't see typically, and it was kind of new to the industry. So I do recall that kind of catching my eye and and looking into that. So I mean, I think it goes without saying that you know, you know, pattern master choke tubes is you know on the front lines of uh, you know research and development and sort of um, you know continuing to push the limits of of what you know choke tubes can bring to uh, you know shotgun hunters and that kind of thing. Um, Dan, did you have anything else that you wanted to? Uh, to, to talk about with Larry before we uh, before we wrap it up? I don't know. I'm kind of jealous that I don't get to go and, and shoot and test it out all the time, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be more than welcome. My shoulder gets sore after a while. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, well, Larry, we we appreciate you taking a few minutes to join us. Um, we encourage all all of our listeners out there to check out uh, Pattern Master. You can find them online, as Larry's referenced, a couple different times at PatternMaster.com. They're also on uh, Facebook and the various social social media platforms. So definitely encourage you uh, all to check out their products. And uh, Larry, again, thanks for joining us. We appreciate all the information that uh, uh, you've brought to the show for us here. And uh, best of luck to you this season. Well, I hope I answered some questions that uh, people might have had out there. Well, we'll send them over to uh, to the uh, Pattern Master uh, Facebook page, and they can uh, if they've got any other questions for you about your products, you've got a a full staff over there that can take care of them there. So, um, again, Larry, appreciate your time, and uh, and let's do it again sometime. You bet. Thank you. So I got to be honest with you, Dan, um, before our conversation with Larry, I had never really thought about how important the shot string was to a waterfowl hunter. Um, it just makes a ton of sense when you think about it, shooting a standing target like a turkey versus a, you know, a wood duck that's buzzing by your hide, you know, and, and it mock five and, you know, you're trying to, you know, get a good, good shot on it. So, I think it's an interesting concept and something that I definitely need to take a look at a little bit closer uh, with my waterfowl setup. Yeah, and I I have to say that was one of the the harder interviews for me because I was just trying to wrap my head around all the information and uh, you know just thinking about the science that actually goes into the choke tubes and the differences between Pattern Master and other companies and like you said you know you. It it gets your mind thinking a little bit, and I think that might be my next purchase. I'm not I'm not gonna lie. Like it just seems like, you know, a shorter shot string. I mean, you want everything hitting at the same time, and um, the last thing you you want is a cripple. And you know, we've talked about that. That's kind of why we go with full chokes, and you know, either you hit them and kill them, or you it's a clean miss. And that's something that I enjoy a good ethical kill. So if if that's going to provide more of an opportunity to, to kill, you know, make a quick 
clean kill. Like that's that's something that I'm definitely going to look into. Yeah, and especially for guys that are hunting divers and stuff like that, you know, I mean, you cripple a bird and it just dives, you know, you could be chasing that bird for a while. So, um, you know, do what, doing whatever you can do to put the, you know, stack the chips in your favor to make a good, clean, clean shot is something that's definitely worth looking into. So, um, you know, we'd encourage you guys to check out Pattern Master Chokes at uh, patternmaster.com. And, uh, you know, you can find them on the, the various social networking sites as well. And, uh, you know, like we said, you know, manufactured right, right in Pennsylvania, right in our backyard. And, um, you know, we're, we obviously enjoy you know, promoting local companies and supporting local companies like that. So definitely give uh, Pattern Master a look. And we appreciate Larry giving us some time and coming on the show. Um, what do you think, Dan? Anything else that you uh, want to cover here before we get into this week's parting shot? Um, I was just going to say, you know, we talked a little bit about Larry's background, but it is quite extensive and, um, you know, he, he knows what he's doing. He knows what's going on. And uh, like you said, just, I encourage people to go and check out what they have going and, you know, there is science behind the shot and that's, you know, that's our slogan there. So go and check it out. And even if you shoot a different choke, go and go and take a look, just see, see what the difference is. All right. So this week's parting shot, um, before I get into it is, is a, is a special one for for us at HP Outdoors. It's it's dealing with Veterans Day, and um, you know this week we're we're celebrating Veterans Day and all of those that have served this country and in, in various capacities and things like that. So um, before we get into it, I just want to give you an opportunity, Dan, if there's anything that you wanted to uh, you know say as far as you know the, the Veterans Day holiday that we're getting ready to uh, observe. Thank you. I mean, that's all (laughs) there's, I wish I could do more. And, you know, these guys give us the ability to do what we love. And, you know, there's so many that we've lost, um, friends and family. And I mean, there's not enough time in a day to, to thank, uh, you know, just to give as much thanks as what we should to these guys and, and ladies out there. Well said. So without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, get into this week's parting shot. So the great patriots of this nation fired the shot heard around the world on the North Bridge Concord Mass, 1775. And from that day forward, the hands of fate you know, set forth where the men and women of the armed services of the United States of America were called upon to answer the bell time and time again. And they've done so following the attacks of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. On D-Day, June 6th, the longest day, 1944, Normandy, France. They did so again in Korea in the 1950s and again in Vietnam in the 1960s. Following the attacks of September 11th, 2001, the global war on terror has taken a toll on this nation like no other. But the men and women of our armed services and her allies have, have rise to the occasion time and time again. In 1776, when the Continental Congress drafted the Declaration of Independence, they knew at that time it wasn't going to be an easy situation. Elmer Davis said that this will remain the land of the free only so long as it remains the home of the brave. And he said that this republic was not established by cowards and it will not um, be preserved by cowards. So to all of the men and women of the U.S. Armed Forces and her allies, thank you from HP Outdoors for everything that you do. And... We encourage each and every one of you out there to shake the hand of a veteran and just to say thank you. I assure you that they deserve it and they do not hear it enough. And for all of us here at HP Outdoors, I just want to say anytime you you need a, you know, you want to go out for a hunt, there's always an empty spot in our blind. So again, thank you for all that you do and all that you will do. That's going to do it for this episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Larry Lutnegger, CEO of Pattern Masters, for joining us. And I um, hope you guys enjoyed our profile, The Mallard Duck. You can check us out on hpoutdoors.com. You can also check us out on iTunes. And if you hadn't had a chance yet, please go on there and fill out a review and a rating. We are greatly appreciative of that. And if you've got any questions or concerns, reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, you can also email us through the website, and we'll be sure to get back to you as soon as we can and uh, continue the conversation. So for Dan, I'm Josh. Thanks again. Take care.